And what I decided to do today is to tell you about two applications, not necessarily from engineering, not both of them from engineering, uh, and to give you a few details of how, how things are actually done. Um, one natural question that people may ask is who cares about small probabilities? And one example that was given this morning was insurance companies where uh, we really care about catastrophic events and even if the probability is small, then it's important to know how often will they occur anyway. But um, uh, um, in engineering, this is happening actually every time you open your cell phone because the rate that you transfer bits or the rate that you transfer information is very high. So we are talking about uh, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 12 bits, number of bits being uh, communicated. And the nature of communication is such that you do not want to lose communication. You don't want to lose uh, bits during this phase. And therefore, if your probability of error is 10 to the minus 6 and you're trying to transmit 10 to the 12 bits, you're going to have lots of errors. And uh, these numbers are not, uh, are not science fiction. These are really the small numbers that people are talking about. So this makes it very natural to talk about uh, small probabilities. So what I would like to talk about are two examples, two applications, one coming from statistical mechanics and one coming actually from a communication problem, but also from a problem in theoretical physics. And uh, I will try to show you how in both these applications, large deviation ideas come in and how this basic paradigm that you should modify you should look for the unlikely event and try to understand how it occurs and build from that and estimate how this is happening in this context. So we had this morning an exposure to the Gaussian distribution, which actually goes back to earlier than Gauss. Uh, Gauss was using it for astronomical data, for analysis of astronomical data. So the Gaussian distribution is just are uh, given by a density on the real line. And it's very common in nature because of the central limit theorem, which tells you that if you have uh, something that is caused by many independent events and somehow they aggregate in a way that eventually looks like a sum, then you will get something Gaussian. So that's the Gaussian distribution. And then we can talk about multivariate Gaussian distribution. So if you have a random vector, a vector of random variables, a multivariate Gaussian is given by the formula over there. Not that you have a quadratic form in your variables with a, mat with a certain matrix lambda, which is a covariance of uh, that vector. And what I want to talk about is the Gaussian field so a Gaussian field is something similar. The index, except for being the numbers 1 to n, are points on the lattice ZD. Okay? So you have a vector whose entries, whose entries are indexed by sites on a lattice. And you are creating a Gaussian distribution, and all the information is contained. Oops, I'm pointing here, but that's not a good idea. All the information is contained in this covariance matrix lambda. And among Gaussian fields, there is one that has been playing an important role and is called the Gaussian uh, uh, free field. I will give you a definition in a second. But this is a simulation. It doesn't look particularly pretty, but it's, it's pretty noisy, right? It looks, there are peaks going up and down in this, uh, in this picture. Um, however, if you actually tried to draw independent variables, they would look much more noisy than that. So maybe you do not appreciate this looks pretty random. But there is order behind this randomness. It is much less wild than uh, an independent entries. 
in the same way that Brownian motion as a pass, which is a sum of independent random variables, is not as wild as taking independent variables, the same number of independent variables. The fact that we are dealing with summation is regularizing things. So what is the definition of the Gaussian free field? We take a box, a unit box, and we discretize, we discretize it. So we take NV intersect with ZD. And then we form a joint distribution. Maybe that's the simplest thing you would guess if you started. You take every variable xi, where i is a point on the lattice. You look at its neighbors, 2D neighbors, and you just form the quadratic form, which is written over the sum of xi minus xj squared. It's easy to see. This is positive definite. And therefore, this is giving us a Gaussian field. This Gaussian field is called the Gaussian free field. And in order not to worry about what happens at the, with infinitely many random variables, I do it in a box, and I'll take boundary conditions. So I'll take in this formula, every time you are on the boundary of the box, points outside the boundary, I will take them to be zero. So this gives us a density. And you can show that if you, several properties of this density are worth while mentioning. First of all, it has a Markov property, what does this mean? If you give me the value of the field or of the variables along a curve in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, or along uh, the boundary of a region in Vn, then what is happening inside becomes independent of what is happening outside given the values on the boundary. So this is the analog of the Markov property that we know for processes. And uh, for high dimensions, and high here means larger, than, larger or equal to 3, the boundary condition actually don't make any difference. You can take the box to infinity, and you get a limiting process. In dimension 2, you have to worry a little bit about the procedure. This will not be true. But in dimension greater or equal to 3, you do get a Gaussian field on all of the lattice, and we call that the Gaussian free field. One interesting thing to do, which is a computation, is that the covariance, so remember in the Gaussian field there was a covariance entering in any Gaussian distribution, there is this covariance lambda over there. So you can give the covariance and the following interpretation. Forgetting completely about Gaussian fields, if I start a random walk at a point, so that's a point x, and I count how many times will it visit a point y. Okay? Now, it's well known that random walk in three dimensions is transient. So it visits every, every site only finitely many times. And I can ask, what is the expectation of this many times? And turns out that this expectation of the number of visits at y when I start at x is exactly the covariance of the Gaussian free field. Either with zero boundary condition if we go only up to the exit from the box, which is what I wrote here, or actually you can do it in the whole space and you'll get. Okay. Now, this. This is a, a, a particularly simple to describe model. It's a model of, of particles in interaction. You can think of a particle at each side with a Gaussian height, and the interaction, the strength of the interaction, is given by the fact that we are looking at a certain energy, which is the sum of the differences squared. And if you start asking yourself, how does such a field look like, then you realize that there is a competition here. On the one hand, the smaller the value, the total value of the energy is, the, um, uh, the higher the probability, because we have e to the minus sum of squares. So the smaller the sum of square is, the higher the probability. On the other hand, we have to sum over all possible configurations in the neighborhood of a point. So there is this healthy competition between the value of the energy or the value of the probability at an individual point 
and the number of configurations around. And this number of configurations around is related to a quantity we have seen this morning and we will see later, which is the entropy uh, that appears in computations. Now, this particular field has been used in many different applications. One special uh, uh, application that I want to focus on was the following question. One can imagine a model for a random droplet or a random surface by doing the following. Take the Gaussian free field and condition it to be positive. So we will get a certain surface if we are in two dimensions. And we can think of that surface as being some kind of interface between uh, two different physical regions. Okay, so uh, I'm, I, I don't want to get too much into the physical motivation and whether it is reasonable or not. It was raised, this kind of question was raised by Leibovitz and Mats, Mass in the late 80s. And the question, what happens to the field? Now, uh, those of you who have played with random walks know that if you do this game in dimension one, in dimension one, as I said, the Gaussian free field is nothing but a Brownian motion, except that at times, uh, not a Brownian motion, sorry, a random walk with Gaussian increments, except that at time zero and at time n, I, I, I pin it down at zero. So it's really a Gaussian bridge. And so what, what happens if I have a bridge like that of length n and I ask it to be positive? This is an unlikely event. But it's not that unlikely as a large deviation, as large deviations go, because uh, it actually has pro polynomial probability. Still, the field will go up. And in fact, the typical trajectory under such a condition, if you ask it to be positive, will go very high, in fact, to a height of order square root n. So what happens in higher than, and, and this, is, this is because of the inherent rigidity in this model. We can move very little from site to site. So what happens in higher dimension? Because you have more and more neighbors, you imagine that things become less and less rigid in higher dimension. And maybe they do not rise at all. For example, if you take IID random variables and you ask them to be positive, nothing like that happens. Okay. So here is the, here is the uh, result that I want to try to explain. So look at the event that everything is positive. So this is our model of interface. We construct an interface by just taking a Gaussian simple model and conditioning everything to be positive. And the result is that you get a field which goes up to a height which is of order square root log n. So in the statement, there is no large deviation because we don't take 1 over n, the log of the probability, or we're not computing a small probability here. Where is a small probability? It is in the conditioning. We are conditioning on a rare event. As we will see a little bit later, this rare event has large deviations attributes. Once we condition on, large, on, on a rare event, large deviations is very efficient in telling us how this rare event is influencing the distribution. And this is really the statement that is written here. One can ask this, well, the statement I'm writing here is in dimension three. One can do it also in dimension two. The scale changes, but not the basic result. And uh, as I said, in dimension one, things are different. This basic result was extended and then used in, in analyzing wetting phenomena and, and phase transitions uh, related to the construction of droplets, but I don't want to speak uh, more in that direction. Instead, I want to give you a little bit of taste how such a, a, a transition occurs or how such a result. So just before I, I, I skip, uh, just to, this is one particular form of writing it. It's maybe a bit awkward. What it says essentially is that if you fix a site and you ask where is the field, what is the height of the field at that site, the answer it is at a constant times square root log n where 
uh, uh, and, and this happens deterministically. So if I fix one side and ask what, where is the field, the field with overwhelming probability is at that height. C is not as of C and D. Sorry? Uh, yes, there is no C. And uh, there shouldn't be, uh, there is a constant C because I ended up writing it explicitly. The constant is 4G, C equal 4G of, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Now, the key to understand this problem is to ask yourself the following question. What is really the probability that the field is positive under the Gaussian free field uh, hypothesis or under the model of Gaussian free field? And of if you had asked it at, for a, 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 a nice stationary and, um, and a field that looks very much like an IID field, you would get an exponent which is of the order n to the power d. For example, if you have independent random variables, each one is positive with probability one half. You ask what is the probability that n to the power d of them are positive. The answer is one half to the power n to the d. And the Gaussian free field is not at all like that. You get uh, a constant which, is, which can be identified, and I want to show you how you identify this constant. And the, the route to identifying this constant is to do what Good described so well this morning, which is to ask yourself, how would I force the field to be positive? And one way to force the field to be positive is to shift it up, to add a constant everywhere. And if you do that, you have to compute, we saw that this morning, the relative entropy, or the kullback labeler distance, between the shifted measure and the original measure. And when you do that, you get the expression that is written here, so this is a computation that I will not, uh, I will not, uh, I will not bother you with. But you get you get this kind of computation where the g is the same green function of the random walk that I mentioned earlier. This is a covariance of the uh, a random walk. This is a covariance of the of the field, and you can now you have transformed everything to a question about scaling of a certain green function which comes from simple random walk. Because we said that the green function of the Gaussian free field is coming from a random walk. So now you have computations involving random walk, and those we know how to do. It's random walk in ZD. You can compute. You can compute the limit. And this is because random walk scales to Brownian motion, the Newtonian capacity enters into the game. So this is not so surprising that when you do that, you end up with such, uh, such a result. And the hard part of the argument is, of course, first of all, what I just described is not exactly correct. This turns out not to be the optimal way to shift. Turns out that it is better to shift not in a regular and uniform way everywhere. So that's, that's one, uh, one change you have to do in this strategy. And of course, the hard part of the work is to show that there does not exist a better strategy. And, uh, and this is the part I'm going to skip. Um, one thing to note is that the scale here for the Gaussian free field is not n to the power d, which is typical of the results mentioned earlier this morning, but n to the power d minus 2 because of the strong correlations and the scaling of the green uh, function. Okay, so that's, that's essentially the story, how, how you get such a, a typical behavior for a model out of a large deviation computation. And once you have understood the right or the proper change of measure, the proper way to lift the field to satisfy the constraint, you also can answer finer questions like what is the law of the process after you made this change. Let me say that dimension two is more delicate, so I'm not going to speak about it at all. The reason that dimension two is more 
delicate is that the correlations in dimension two are stronger, and so it is not enough to essentially do a change of measure once globally for the whole field. You have to, do, to introduce some multi-scale analysis. And uh, uh, what is interesting, the picture is not so, so very good, but uh, let me try to explain what you see here. What I wanted to uh, emphasize is that if you move to dimension two, you can ask yourself, how do the maxima or the minima of this Gaussian free field look like? Uh, so by argument similar to what I showed here, you know that the maxima are of the order of constant log n, and you can compute this constant. And you can ask yourself, okay, uh, how do they look? Where are they located? So it's hard to see from the simulation uh, on the right. The simulation on the left is something very different. You take a simple random walk in two dimensions, and you ask yourself, are there points where it spends atypically large time? So uh, uh, the red color that is on the uh, northeast corner of the picture is actually a location where the random walk has spent an atypically large time. Blue means that it spent essentially typical time. Green is less than typical, etc. And it turns out that the, the structure of these two objects is very different. But the structure of the extremes of these two objects turns out to be very closely related. They have the same correlation structure. You can compute, you can compute uh, uh, all sorts of quantities like the fractal dimension of the set of maxima, et cetera, et cetera. And this turned out to be exactly the same. And the, one of the reasons I'm mentioning it here is that this was maybe not emphasized this morning, but one of the uh, interests of Raghu has been looking at uh, uh, intersection properties of random walk and the local time that random walk spend at a, at a location, etc. And he had a very influential paper or appendix to a paper uh, in that uh, context in the late 60s. And in fact, this idea is permeates through the work related to the left. And as I said, it turns out that the structure in the left and the structure in the right are the same. So I could not resist the temptation uh, to mention it here. Uh, one other thing I want to mention before dropping this topic, um, the Gaussian free field turns out to be really interesting in two dimensions. And in fact, if you want to learn more about it, the nice simulations I took from uh, Scott Sheffield, and if you go to his website, you will see very interesting recent results relating the properties of level lines of the Gaussian free field and certain conformally invariant processes that uh, have been the SLE process that have been very, uh, very successful in explaining many phenomena, and in particular also the level lines of the Gaussian free field. So it's really a, a, a rich source of examples um, that appears also in statistical applications. Okay, I would like to move to a different application, so completely switch off the statistical mechanics side, and go to a problem that originated in multi-user communications. So the situation is the following. You have uh, N transmitters and M receivers, and what you are transmitting, you are transmitting over a channel, and this channel is a linear channel that has different gains into different relations. So if this seems very uh, unclear, think of your cellular phone. Think of several antennas in your cellular phone, which is what eventually where we are going to. We have several antennas in an array. Think of the receiver as also having several antennas. And uh, that would be one example. Another example is think simply of different users transmitting with some array of antennas at a receiver, which is what actually is happening 
uh, today. So uh, in such a situation, the model, maybe I should do, let you see a picture that will make it clearer. So we have a bank of users on the left side. We have uh, a matrix of gains X, which is this big box in the middle. And then each receiver receives the sum of what has been transmitted by different users plus noise. Right? So that's the basic uh, communication model. And uh, just to make it realistic, so the noises we are going to assume independent. And on the other hand, the, um, the transmitted signals, you cannot transmit with more power that you have available at the transmitter. OK, so think of this as a power constraint. You cannot transmit more than the amplifier or the transmitter that you bought. And a basic question is communication is how much information can you transmit over such a channel? And uh, Shannon, whose picture <coughs> is depicted there, uh, showed that under appropriate, so this is a consequence, of course, he did not exactly look at this channel, but the consequence of his results is that the capacity, which is a rate you can transmit over the number of bits per second that you can transmit over such a channel, is given by a formula which is, uh, uh, which is over there. So it's a trace of the log of I plus x p x star. x is a channel matrix. OK, that was a matrix of gains between transmitters and receivers. And p is a matrix of powers, the constraint on individual user powers. So this is the best rate that you can transmit with. And of course, this is the sum of the log of certain eigenvalues of this matrix x p x star. Now, of course, this quantity cm is random. If you assume that the gain matrix is random, which is typically the case, then the capacity is going to be, this quantity Cm is going to be random. But when M is large, what you would expect is that uh, um, Cm over M converges. Now, remember, what is Cm? Cm is a, some function of eigenvalues of a certain large random matrix. So if you divide by m, this becomes a function of the empirical measure of the eigenvalues, the average of uh, the measure that consists of uh, the averaged histogram, if you want, of the eigenvalues of the same types that we saw this morning. But again, the lambda i are not independent, far from independent. They are eigenvalues of a random matrix. They have a complicated dependence structure. Even if the entries of the matrix are independent, the map between the entries of the matrix and the eigenvalues is complicated. So the lambda i's have a complicated interaction. Still, you may ask yourself, what happens? And it's a fact that goes back to, in this context, to Pasteur and Marchenko, that this empirical measure converges. So, there is a certain limiting measure, such that if the dimension of the matrix is large, and you ask what is the empirical measure of the resulting matrix, this quantity converges to a deterministic limit. And there is an equation for this deterministic limit. You can write it down. And in particular, what that tells you is that the capacity, the normalized capacity, the capacity per user, converges to a deterministic limit, which you can compute. And then what you are interested in is the outage probability. What is the probability that in a large system, the capacity will be catastrophically low, will be much lower than what you expect? So in order to answer that, I want to do a digression to talk a little bit about random matrices. And so uh, the basic the basic uh, model of random matrices, if you take a random Hermitian matrix with uh, random uh, entries except for the constraint of, uh, of being Hermitian, you can write down the joint distribution of eigenvalues. And it is the expression that is written on the blackboard. It has a van der Monde uh, 
component that comes exactly from the Jacobian of the map I mentioned before between entries and eigenvalues. And it has a Gaussian component, which is uh, written over there. So that's a particular matrix. And this somehow is related to my first topic, because if now you have, eigen if you think about this expression, the expression that I wrote here, well, we have a term sum lambda i square. This is maybe not so much an interaction, but the van der Monde, if you write it as an exponent of something, this introduces an energy, certain interaction between particles, between the lambda i's. You now think of the lambda i's as particles. So we are in a very similar situation. And when you rewrite things in this language, what do you get? You get a joint distribution of eigenvalues given in terms of ln, of the empirical measure. There is a linear term, linear meaning linear in ln, which is just the integral of ln against the function x squared over 2. This is nothing but the sum of the eigenvalue squared. And there is a quadratic term, which comes from the log interaction, taking simply the log of the van der Monde determinant. And now you can ask, you can play the large deviations game. You can ask yourself, well, what is the probability of having an atypical realization of the eigenvalues? Remember, an atypical realization of eigenvalues, if we do it for the matrices that came up in the communication problem, will give us an atypical capacity. So if we want to understand what is creating atypical capacities, the answer is atypical behavior of the configuration of eigenvalues. And if you stare a moment in this formula, it becomes clear, and it was clear essentially to physicists, what should be done. Namely, there is a variational formula involving the measure, and the deviation will be given by the minimizers of that variational exponent. And to actually prove it requires a bit of work, but this turns out to be correct. This was done by Benarus and Guillonet in the late 90s. Uh, so the, the, the answer is that you do get a large deviation principle at uh, this um, at the, the scale and uh, speed n squared, and with a formula that has the linear term and the quadratic term in it. The quadratic term already appeared in the late 80s in work of Voiculescu uh, regarding uh, random matrices, where he was essentially computing, although not in this language, he was essentially computing the entropy namely the number of configurations in a narrow band around a given one for random matrices. Okay. So, once you have such a large deviation principle, of course you can find the typical behavior, which people knew in this context since Wigner, simply by looking at the points where the rate function is minimized. So the points where the rate function is minimized are the points that are the most likely uh, under a given scenario. This can be extended to matrices of the form X, X star. Now this is where X has independent, ent independent Gaussian entries. This is closer to our communication model. Remember, in the communication model, what was important was X, P, X star, where P was the power vector. And then you can write down a joint distribution of eigenvalues, similarly to that. And this resolves the capacity issue. You can do, you can compute outage, outage probabilities, et cetera, et cetera, without much difficulties, and all the tools are in place. I want to emphasize that, like in the first problem I described, the scale in which deviations occur is very different from the scale that you would guess for independent random variables. The scale is 1 over n squared in the exponent, uh, is n squared in the exponent and not n. And this is because there is a very strong interaction between particles here. So what happens in the engineering problems that I mentioned in the beginning? So I'm going now to this model x, p, x star. <coughs> 
And now when you start to write down the joint distribution of eigenvalues, you discover a small disaster. And the small disaster is that you, you see, why could we write a joint distribution of eigenvalues in the previous cases? Essentially, because you could write a Gaussian matrix, you can, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors are independent because of symmetry of the model. You take a Gaussian matrix, multiply it by a hard distributed, conjugate it with a hard distributed matrix, it's still Gaussian. And nothing has changed. So uh, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are uh, independent, so you can integrate out the angular variables and reduce significantly the dimension of the problem. You started with n square random variables, you ended up with n random variables. What happens with this model? Well, this model lacks this invariance properties, and when you write down the joint distribution of eigenvalues, you are left with an integral that is written on the right side here, which I will refer to as a spherical integral. And this spherical integral involves integration over orthogonal or unitary, depending whether you started with uh, with real or complex matrices. In the communication problem, it is more reasonable to talk about complex entries because they have phase. We're talking about signals in, uh, in high frequency, so they have phase. Uh, in certain other applications, real signals are more reasonable. So depending on the application, you will end up either on with integration over uh, orthogonal or over unitary. Uh, uh, matrices. The problem is that now the number of variables that in, are involved in this integration is of the order of n square. So you have not succeeded in reducing something that had n square to something with only n variables. And really, uh, um, uh, although this is not clear in, uh, if, until you begin to think about it, really the power of large deviations is when you are able to capture a complicated system with a relatively small number of attributes. That's one way to look at a uh, large deviation. You start with a complicated system and then you have an empirical measure and you have something that depends not too critically or in a continuous way in this, on this empirical measure, then you are in good shape. So similarly here, here you don't succeed in doing it. So you need to understand how to handle the asymptotics for such integrals. And these integrals appeared already in many contexts. And uh, in fact, there's a fundamental formula due to Arishandra that gives this integral in terms of a certain determinant. Um, however, if you try to do asymptotics, you, first of all, the, the formulas of Arishandra work well for the unitary case, not for the orthogonal case. But more important than that, if you try to do asymptotics, a determinant has a nasty property that it is differences of positive terms. In this case, it's a determinant of matrix with positive entries, but you have not too many terms, n factorial. n factorial is tiny compared to exponent of n squared, so that's not a problem. n factorial is tiny. But uh, uh, you do have differences of large terms. And when you take differences of large terms, it's not clear that the sum of differences is dominated by the largest one. And in fact, in this problem, you can show it is not. So the question is, how do you approach such a problem? And what should be clear that all the other terms you can handle uh, in a, in a uh, standard way, but this uh, spherical integral, you really need to understand the asymptotics of such spherical integrals where you have matrices A and B whose empirical measure, let me write again what is, so in this spherical integral there are two matrices, A and B. One matrix A is a matrix P that we had in the beginning. The matrix B is a matrix of eigenvalues, lambda 1 up to lambda n. You suppose that the eigenvalues, the empirical measure is close to a particular point, and you are trying to understand the asymptotics of that. Okay, so this is the 
let me skip that. Uh, yeah. Let me let me uh, before we move on to the first of computation. This looks a little bit hopeless until you realize that a similar integral occurs in a slightly different problem. Namely, if you look at a if you look at the Wigner matrix X, so the same matrix that I described in the beginning, and you add to it a matrix A, and you ask yourself, what can we say about the eigenvalues of this sum, where A is diagonal? So if you, if you look at the joint distribution, you need to exponentiate something like Z squared. Remember that x, you can write it as u d u star, where d are the eigenvalues, and u are the eigenvectors. So when you take the square, you will have terms involving a only, terms involving d lambda only, and the interaction term will be exactly of the form that was in this exponent. It will be a u d lambda u star which is exactly of the form, and it will all be exponentiated. So understanding such spherical integrals and understanding the large deviations for the, measure, for the uh, eigenvalues of this matrix is the same problem at the end of the day. So we need to understand the eigenvalues of that. Now, this turns out to be a hard problem, and, uh, and so... In order to do it, what I want to, to do is digress a little. And instead of dealing with this problem, make it slightly harder. And how will I make it slightly harder? I will introduce time. So instead of asking about the eigenvalues of such a matrix, what I will do is ask about the eigenvalues such a matrix, where X is a matrix whose entries are not Gaussian random variables, but Brownian motions. So at time one, it will be exactly what we had before. At time zero, everything is very easy because we only have the matrix A. In between, I have dy dynamics at my disposal, so maybe I can use the dynamics to say something. And this idea really is are uh, very strongly influenced by things that have been developed in terms of hydrodynamics that we did not discuss today at all, but I can uh, assure you that this is really coming from that direction. So I will give uh, credit a little bit later. This was an idea essentially of, in a, in a very closely related context of Alice Guillonet and uh, um, Thierry Cabanal de Villar. They said, well, we'll add time and see what happens. So, <coughs> let me skip that. So, we are now at this location. So, we are trying to compute the large deviations not for xn of 1 plus d, but of xn of t plus d. And the idea now is, okay, if we have... Oh, a Brownian motion, we have many ways to change measure. Instead of before when we had just a variable, we could add something to it and maybe do something correlated between entries, here we can add a function of time to every entry. So we have made it much richer, we have created many more possibilities to change the measure. If you create more possibilities to change the measure, then you may be able to hit the right one. It is more likely that you will find the right way that the measure changes than if you are considering only a smaller collection of possibilities. And one systematic way to do it is to say, well, let us look at the empirical measure. So this is a certain measure-valued process indexed by time. So for each different time, I have a different measure. And let us compute 
how it evolves when I hit it with a test function. You do this exercise and you discover that you can write a stochastic equation for it. And in particular, you can identify a family of martingales from this equation. So martingales are objects that we like very much because if we exponentiate them, we know how to exponentiate martingales such that we still get martingales, but they are positive. And therefore, they can serve as Radon-Nicodym derivatives. So, so once you do that, uh, let me maybe skip the uh, actual uh, form of the martingale because this really too much details, but let us try to compute an upper bound now. Let us try to see, once I have this kind of martingale, once I have an expression, how can I get an upper bound? So we saw something like that this morning. You take the probability that your empirical measure, the one that you are trying to understand, is in a small region of space. So this is the left-hand side, this probability on the left-hand side. You write it as an expectation. So the probability of an event is the expectation of an indicator of that event. Then you multiply and divide by your martingale. You did nothing. You multiplied and divided. But you carefully chose your martingale such that on the set, which is in the indicator, you know its value. So you can pull out one of the terms in the multiplication. In fact, the term 1 over m outside of the expectation. So you get this exponential term. Uh, this you have to take with trust that this is the value of the martingale on that particular term. And then you have the expectation of an indicator times a martingale. OK, the martingale is positive. The expectation of an indicator times a martingale is certainly bounded above by the expectation of just a martingale. The indicator is bounded by 1. So we end up with an explicit bound for each such, such martingale, for each such change of measure, you get a different bound. So all that remains is optimized over all possibilities of making the change of measure. Okay? Okay, so that's the upper bound. What about the lower bound? So, again, Magoo was mentioning it uh, this morning, and uh, I want to go over it uh, quickly. Uh, the point is that if you write down what is the rate function, what is the expression that you get in this exponent, you can always write it as, uh, as uh, a bilinear form, and uh, the supremum is then obtained as a linear functional uh, uh, with respect to a certain value g. And it turns out that this value g is telling you locally what is the drift you have to add to the diffusion in order to make, uh, uh, um, to create this martingale. And so uh, uh, we can define a new measure using this g. And what, uh, uh, what we can check is that under this new measure, the empirical measure will satisfy the equations that I wrote here with star. So you will get a certain ex equation describing the limit of the empirical measure under the change of measure indexed by this g, or indexed by this new drift or new field that uh, Ragu didn't quite have time to finish in his talk. So, <laughs> right. so uh, essentially, uh, this tells you that at points such that you can, so if I give you an empirical measure, and you can find a G, a local drift, that changes the typical behavior to that point, and you can prove that, uh, that indeed this is a typical behavior under the new thing. The indicator that we had before, remember when we did the upper bound, 
when we did the upper bound, where was it? Sorry for this. Here, when we did the upper bound, at the end we have the expectation of an indicator times the martingale. We bounded it from above by just taking the expectation of the mounting, of uh, we, we threw away the indicator. But if the typical behavior is that this indicator is happening with high probability, then it's also in a lower bound. And so the conclusion is that if you can show, if you can find a G such that the behavior is where you want it to be, then uh, you have a complementary lower bound. And what does it mean such that the behavior is where you want it to be? The behavior, the, the behavior is, is uh, uh, characterized by the solution of the equation star. So now you have transferred completely your question about lower bound to a question, is the solution of star unique? Because if the solution is unique, this point where you attach your mass is characterized, and you have a complementary lower bound to your upper bound. So, so now I'm, uh, so this is just the lower bound as before. I don't want to go over uh, uh, the details. And now the point is that, of course, if G is smooth enough, in a proper sense that I don't want to describe, then it's not hard to solve the uniqueness. But unfortunately, you cannot cover all space with such smooth Gs. So this is always a kind of problem that you, you run into when you try to actually do large deviations. So as long as you say the general principles, uh, that's all fine. But at some point, you have to get your hands very dirty. And uh, some wizardry is often needed and appreciated. Uh, and this is one of the places where uh, the, the experts are really appreciative of what uh, uh, Ragu did. And so uh, 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 when you need to dirty your hands, of course, uh, uh, this limits the range of applicability. And at the end, in the problems that I'm describing here in, in work of Ione and myself, this, this program can be carried out. But really, all the steps that I described, they all can be traced down to the work in hydrodynamics uh, and large deviations that Ragu had done. Um, the end result, by the way, just to show you how does it look. So if you have this, uh, so remember, the problem was to compute the asymptotics of this spherical integral. You had two measures, A and B, which came from this matrix and that matrix. And at the end, the solution to the uh, large deviations problem is given in terms of a solution to an Euler equation, a nonlinear equation. Uh, and in fact, this nonlinear e equation has a very simple interpretation. It is telling you what is the solution of this equation. So this is an equation with boundary conditions. And it is telling you how the change of measure is occurring along the whole trajectory between A at time 0 and A plus X, wherever you ask it to be at time 1. And in a sense, the solution is giving you a transport equation. It is telling you how to go from a certain measure to another measure while minimizing a cost that is given by that uh, large deviation rate function. Uh, OK. And I think I want to stop here by again congratulating uh, Ragu and saying thank you, because otherwise we would, certainly I would not be here. Thank you very much.